Hello, my name is James Robson and I'm the Victor and William Fung Director of the Harvard Asia Center. The Asia Center's author conversation series is aimed at highlighting insightful engagements with authors of books published recently by the Asia Center Publications Program and other publishers on topics of interest to the Asia Center's mission of fostering research on Asia in transnational and transregional perspectives. We very much hope you enjoy the conversations. Good morning, everyone, uh, or afternoon or evening, wherever anybody is signing in from. I think uh, we're uh, ready to get this webinar underway. Um, my name is James Robson, and I'm the uh, Victor and William Fung Director of the Harvard University Asia Center. And it's my pleasure to be moderating uh, this morning's conversation as part of our uh, Authors Conversation series. Uh, in order to discuss a uh, book uh, by Arjun Subramanian uh, entitled A Military History of India Since 1972, Full Spectrum Operations and the Changing Contours of Modern Conflict. And we will also then be joined with, uh, with some comments by M. Taylor uh, Fravel, uh, who uh, is a professor of political science at MIT. Uh, and I'll be giving fuller introductions in just a minute. Just a quick note on the format today. Um, I will give uh, some uh, very brief opening uh, comments uh, to introduce our speakers today. Uh, they will then uh, each uh, take turns uh, in, in providing their uh, some opening comments uh, and also commentary. And then uh, we will have uh, some time for Q&A from the audience. And uh, please use the Q&A function uh, on the lower menu uh, in, in Zoom. Uh, and you can just enter in your questions there and I'll be moderating those uh, questions as they come in. So uh, I'd like to uh, first begin by introducing our, uh, uh, the author of the book that's under discussion today. Uh, this is Arjun Subramaniam, and he is the president, uh, president's chair of excellence uh, in national security at India's National Defense College. He is a retired fighter pilot from the Indian uh, Air Force who has flown a variety of uh, high-tech uh, planes and has commanded MiG-21 Squadron in a large flying base and held several operational staff and instructional assignments in the Indian Air Force. He is an air-powered doctrinal expert, having crafted uh, the current Indian uh, Air Force doctrine in 2012, and he was awarded the Ati uh, Vishisht Seva Medal for Distinguished Service by the President of India in 2011. He has a PhD in Defense and Strategic Studies from the University of Madras, and he's been a visiting fellow at the Harvard Asia Center uh, at Oxford University and a visiting professor at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, uh, Ashoka University, and Jindal University. Currently, he's also an adjunct faculty member at the Naval War College, and he's lectured extensively at a wide range of universities, think tanks, and war colleges in, in India and abroad, including Harvard, MIT, Georgetown, Oxford, and the Carnegie Endowment. Um, so his current areas uh, of focus are international and regional security, contemporary Indian military history, air power in integrated operations, and the India-China security relationship. He's the author of four books, including uh, India's Wars, A Military History, 1947 to 1971, and this newly released uh, sequel, as he describes it, entitled A Military History of India uh, Since 1972, Full Spectrum Operations and the Changing Contours of Modern Conflict, which is the focus of our discussion today. So thank you very much for joining us, Arjun. And then we will have comments by M. Taylor uh, Fravel, who is the Arthur and Ruth Sloan uh, Professor of Political Science and the Director of Security Studies Program at MIT. Uh, Professor Fravel studies international relations with a focus on international security, China and East Asia. His books include uh, Strong Borders, Secure Nation, Cooperation in the Conflict in China's Territorial Disputes uh, by Princeton University Press in 2008, and also Active Defense, China's Military Strategy Since 1949, also through Princeton, and uh, published in 2019. His other pu publications have appeared in International Security, uh, Foreign Affairs, Security Studies, International Studies Review, The China Quarterly, uh, uh, The Washington Quarterly, um, uh, Journal of Strategic Studies, Armed Forces and Society, Current History, Asian Survey, uh, and, uh, and uh, excuse me, the uh, uh, China Leadership Monitor and Contemporary Southeast Asia. So very widely uh, published in these uh, major journals. Professor Fravel is a graduate of Middlebury College and Stanford University where he received his PhD. 
He also is, has graduate degrees from the London School of Economics and Ox Oxford University, uh, where he was a Rhodes Scholar. And in 2016, he was named an Ar Andrew uh, Carnegie Fellow uh, by the Carnegie Corporation. He is a member of the Board of Directors of the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations and serves as the Principal Investigator for the Maritime Awareness Project. And we're very glad that you could join us today, Professor Fravel, perfect uh, uh, commentator for this uh, very interesting and, and detailed book. So um, what I'd like to do now is turn uh, the mic over to Arjun uh, for your opening comments. And thank you again for joining us. Good morning and good evening, ladies and gentlemen, uh, depending on where you are. Uh, thank you for signing in. Uh, and thank you, James, for those very gracious and detailed introductory remarks. Uh, and also to the Harvard Asia Center for hosting this discussion uh, and the initiative shown by Tenzin to stitch this together. I'm also delighted to welcome uh, Professor Taylor Frevel, uh, the director of the MIT Security Studies Program to this discussion and for sparing some time for what I'm sure would be a well-deserved summer break. Uh, and I'm sure all of you uh, are waiting to listen to his comments on the book as eagerly as I am. Uh, now, what I've done is that uh, uh, unlike uh, some of the earlier discussions that I've been in, uh, I thought I'll divide my segment uh, of, of this session into three portions. Uh, in the first portion, uh, I think I will share some perspectives uh, on my journey as a writer, uh, because uh, I've always felt that a writer's journey is as important as his or her work. And my journey as a military historian has followed really a less trodden path uh, that should interest some of you. Now the Harvard Asia Center was the first stop as I went off the highway after 36 years as a mainstream operational fighter pilot in the Indian Air Force. I had already made a leap of faith and written my first serious military history offering, which was India's wars, a military history from 47 to 71, as James mentioned, while still in service. It was a shot in the dark, really, and written on the wings of hope and propelled by a passion for military history and the support from scores of veterans who offered credible operational and battle accounts of the various conflicts that I wrote about. Several readers, colleagues, and veterans uh, actually urged me to start thinking about a sequel. And I realized that I had, the, I had this very, very rare opportunity of writing about war and conflict that has panned out in my own lifetime, much of it during my active service career. However, I knew that the task at hand would be far more challenging as a serving two-star officer and had to take a tough call to hang up my uniform two years ahead of retirement, uh, which is really a tough call from several perspectives, from a settlement perspective, from a family perspective. But I nevertheless took the plunge, uh, knowing fully well that there was a product and there was an idea that needed to fructify sooner than later. Now, uh, concurrently, I also had this desire to write for an international readership for which I wanted to spend some quality research and writing time overseas. So I sent in my book proposal to several institutions. And actually, it was thanks to Professor Sugata Bose at Harvard uh, and the Tata Education Trust, uh, because of which I could avail of a fall term fellowship at the Harvard Asia Center, researching and writing, uh, where I actually interestingly shared an office with a retired uh, Japanese Lieutenant General, who was a former vice chief of their uh, army, who was also writing a book uh, on, on, on how the Japanese military was dealing with the Fukushima nuclear uh, disaster. So I did much of the same during the spring of 2018 in Oxford also, writing my first draft and then taught a course at Fletcher in the fall of 2018 that revolved around all the material that I had collected for this book and streamlined into several chapters. So it was actually good weaning in uh, with, with, with diverse opinions uh, that finally made the book. So this volume is actually a standalone, uh, is, is, is a standalone publishing for an international readership by the University Press of Kansas as part of their Modern War series. Uh, and I must mention that the entire publishing, editorial, and peer reviewing experience was an enriching one for me. And though Kansas has published a couple of books by Western scholars 
uh, on the British Indian Army in World War II. I'm actually delighted that this is probably their first book on contemporary Indian military history by an Indian author. So if there are practitioner folks among you who have an intellectual passion, the idea and the will, I will advise you not to let go of it till you actually have a product. Now to the flavor of the book. Uh, here again, I thought I'd do things a little differently. Uh, you, know, you know, there is an intriguing website, which many of you, if you've not seen it, must go through in the US, which is called DOD Reads. That is steered by a naval officer who realized rather late on in his career, the importance of reading uh, in a military career. When I first pitched the book to him, uh, John assessed it, in his, assessed it to his review team as a, a solid graduate level book, which sounded good to me, but not exactly what I wanted it to be. So when his team wrote to me, uh, they said, uh, and, and I quote from that email, uh, I'm Jen uh, and I coordinate our book review team and I'd love to consider your book for review. I've added it to our list and will notify you as soon as we have an interested reader. However, I'd like to share two thoughts on the book with you. First, the subject matter is what we consider here as urgent for a military professional in the coming decades. Second, academic and graduate level books are sometimes difficult to get through. Without knowing yet how yours reads, we won't know how it will do with our readership, but we will take an honest look and let you know. So I replied by clarifying, let me clarify that my book follows a crossover narrative style that is a tad different from typical academic writing, while at the same time ensuring research rigor. The book is full of maps. It has several photographs and is peppered with practitioner interviews and experiences. To which I got a reply from Jen. Thank you for clarifying the writing style. It's probably perfect for our audience and it sounds like your book will do well with them. I'm honestly very excited about it myself. So actually, rather than explaining to you, uh, I thought I should let the email exchange speak for itself about how the book will read for a wide constituency of readers. So this book fo largely follows the chronological sequence from 1972 onwards. But I received a lot of reader feedback after my first book, which I've respected. And this feedback pointed at some omissions in my first book. Uh, readers asked me that, uh, uh, why is it that the insurgencies in the Northeast that started as early as 1955 have not featured? So I've included that in this book as part of the larger panoply of uh, insurgencies uh, in, in Northeastern India. Then we had a face-off between India and China in 1967 across the mountain pass at Nathula, which now assumes Tremendous significance because it conveys an attitude of the Indians, which, which, which was prevalent at that particular time and actually triggered a renaissance uh, in, in, in Indian military thinking vis-a-vis -vis the Chinese. So Nathula features uh, uh, in my book over here. And of course, I think India has done a wonderful job in UN peacekeeping operations right from the 1950 onwards in Korea in the 1950s and the Democratic Republic of Congo in the, in, in the 1960s. So I have blended all these operations seamlessly into this narrative. Uh, and I'm glad I did it because uh, it actually adds a wholesomeness uh, to the two narratives. Now, one of my pet phrases while describing the book is that it peels like an orange uh, with the outer layer comprising strategic analysis and the big picture. The next layer dealing with operational and tactical vignettes and actually at the core of the book lie the soldiers, sailors, and airmen who actually made this book possible. So let me share some of my favorite vignettes from the book from all these three silos. Uh, you know, there's been a perception across the world that India's military leaders are largely focused on the operational domain and have not contribute, contributed much to the evolution of national security strategy. Yes. They have not articulated themselves in the open domain until very recently. But I repeatedly argue in my book, based on my interviews and after, after browsing through several personal diaries and recollections, that there has often been prescient and sage advice 
that was forthcoming from generals to the political and strategic establishment, particularly on JNK and strategies across the line of actual control. And this is why I particularly like my chapters on Jammu and Kashmir and the one called stress along the line of control, where one can clearly track how India at times has paid the price for not listening to strategic guidance emerging from brilliant field commanders. At the operational and tactical level, my favorite sections in the book are the ones that deal with Siachen and Sri Lanka. One, a resounding success, and the other one, a chastening failure. Some of the battle accounts are actually straight out of a commando comic. And uh, rather than reading one or two of them out to you, uh, I think I will leave them for you to explore uh, in the book. Now, coming down to the core of my book, and that is people. I was indeed fortunate to engage over the last nine years with some of India's finest generals, admirals, and air marshals, along with several other officers across ranks, many of, many of who have been mates from school and the several academies that I've trained in. As also a few junior commissioned officers who have firm imprints of the action that they have seen over the years. Now, these are the folk who form the core of my book. Another thing I'm quite happy about in the book is that most of my accounts have been well triangulated. And much like India's wars, where I've really not received any major pushback on the accuracy of events, I'm certain that this one too will largely follow that path. Of course, with such a vast landscape, there are bound to be a few contrarian views, and I will accept them with all humility uh, as I receive them. To be very honest, writing the book has been a bruising experience in many ways, but in no way matches the trials and tribulations of its principal protagonists. And along the way, I'm actually deeply indebted to the hundreds of veterans I've engaged with. I'm deeply indebted to my family who's been very patient through nine years, to my publishers, and to all those who supported me during both these books, particularly the latter one, uh, which are largely solo, you, you know, which are solo writings. And why do I say solo writings? Because for none of the books did I receive a writing fellowship. I, I applied to many grants, came out a cropper uh, in, in, in most of them. Uh, I really didn't have the luxury of having a research assistant uh, through any of these books. Uh, and, and therefore the satisfaction uh, it, it, it is, is pretty much, uh, uh, you know, uh, is pretty much evident. Uh, and I'm glad that I did it uh, the way uh, it has finally emerged. On a more analytical plane, uh, I think I will end the second section by bringing into focus four or five defining but recurring facets of India's armed forces that I've tried to showcase uh, in my book. Number one, looking at how India has evolved as a nation state since independence from colonial rule in 1947, the trajectory has hardly been peaceful. Much as traditional historians and social scientists have tried to project India as a peace-loving democracy, the reality is much different to the extent that I would say that India has been a warring democracy, not in a revisionist or an expansive sense, but rather in a defensive and protective sense. And I will show you how I have arrived at that prognosis during my slideshow. Flowing from that proposition uh, is another fact that India's armed forces have played an important role in India's evolution as a strong, stable, and vibrant democracy. Uh, by pitching in whenever there have been fissures and cracks that have, that have uh, uh, threatened to break open. And this is another facet that has actually been underplayed in contemporary Indian historical discourse. Moving to the operational level, the three services have constantly been exposed to the changing contours of conflict across decades and actually have adapted well despite being a large and conservative military. Though at places I do argue that response mechanisms could have been better in terms of being more proactive and more assertive. 
And there is a reason for this because India's military responses to conflict situations, both external and internal, have largely followed political guidance, which is how it ought to be in a democracy. Whether assertive and proactive or restrained and diffident, it has always been political guidance that has largely dictated military responses. So I think I'm on track in terms of time and I do have the luxury of uh, uh, showing you a, some vignettes from my book in terms of showcasing the importance and impact of maps and photographs while writing and narrating military history. Uh, it is not for nothing that people say that a map and a photograph can actually replace a thousand words. And I can safely say that the impact factor of both books have significantly gone up because of the embedded maps and photographs. So let me quickly pull up my PowerPoint presentation. Okay, I hope, uh, uh, I hope this, uh, the presentation is visible to everyone. Yeah, okay. Yes, looks good. Okay, okay. So, uh, and, 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 and folks, doesn't the cover look good? Uh, I, I quite like the cover. Uh, and uh, uh, so a military history of India since 1972. Uh, and some of the key phrases I like are full spectrum and the changing contours of modern conflict, because isn't that what every military today is, is grappling with. And particularly large militaries uh, have always uh, 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 faced the wrong end of the stick when it comes to adapting to the changing contours of, of modern conflict. Okay, so now this certainly doesn't look happenings in a peaceful democracy. If you look at the list that is, that is there on the screen, you will find the entire landscape of war and conflict that I have featured in both my books. And if you, and, 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 and that is why I offer a proposition and ask a question that has India's rise really been peaceful? Or is it some kind of a warring democracy like many other democracies in the world today? And I think after the United States and Israel, I think no other democracy in the post-World War II era has experienced so much of war and conflict as India has. And that's why I was extremely surprised when I set out to write my first book that military history has not been uh, a discipline that has been that has widely proliferated in India in the post-independence era. And I'm not going to get into why that has happened. Uh, uh, I think those of you who read my first book and who would read this book would get a flavor as to why military history has been essentially a sideshow till now. But I'm glad that, that things are looking up. So uh, I just wanted to show you folks some of the maps that I've got in the book. Now, uh, one of the things that I enjoyed about the maps in the book is that I will call these maps as curated maps. And why do I say that they are curated maps? They are curated maps because the maps convey what I've narrated in the book. They aren't standalone maps. So, so if there's something I've, I've written about, about our peacekeeping missions in the Democratic Republic of Congo or in Sierra Leone, uh, it is there depicted on the map. So the map is devoid of too much of clutter and it is a writer's map. It is not a cartographer's map. Uh, and you can see the emphasis. For example, the map on the right-hand side, which, which, uh, uh, which displays various military action by uh, Indian peacekeeping forces in, in Congo, have, have pretty much spread across the entire uh, eastern uh, border with Congo, the southern and the eastern body of border with Congo, whether it was in... Uh, 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 you, know, you know, whether it was in the, 1950s, in the 1960s or whether it is through the 1990s uh, uh, and, and, and the 2000s. Now, let me go to the next map. The next two maps are also maps that uh, I've carefully looked at and, and tried to plot the trajectory and the expansion of the covert war in Jammu and Kashmir, both in the Kashmir Valley, as well as south of the Pir Panjal range into the Jammu region. Uh, and, and I knew that some of the things that would interest readers would be, uh, what are the kind of infiltration routes that were taken into the valley? Uh, 
which what have been the areas that have seen uh, the maximum number of artillery duels uh, wh wh where is it uh, where is it that some of the indian army's formations are located and how have they coped with this expansion of the insurgency in jammu and kashmir into a full blown covert and a proxy war uh, you know since 19 uh, since 1989 and of course uh, some of my pet maps have always been the maps that uh, that depict uh, action and face offs and skirmishes along the line of actual control there is actually one more map in my book that depicts the doklam area but these are essentially areas of ladakh and arunachal pradesh that have seen the maximum amount of uh, uh, you know action when it comes to uh, the various face offs skirmishes and encounters between uh, the indians and the chinese across the line of uh, across the line of actual control uh, and i think uh, uh, particularly the map on the left would would interest several readers in the context of what has uh, gone on uh, it's not all that detailed but then uh, i had to choose between uh, peppering it with too much of detail and making it visually appealing right uh, some of the photographs that are there in the book uh, you know the, the the photographs in this uh, book are all black and white but uh, that doesn't take away from the impact factor uh, now this is siachen glacier Uh, the photograph on the top right is one of the early brigade commanders brigadier nanavati talking to his you know engaging with troops at giongla one of the highest posts on the nor northern glacier and of course you have this spectacular sequence of a paradrop on the uh, on the siachen glacier floor and this is how uh, it is on almost every day in the year when the weather is flyable now here's another uh, here are another interesting set of photographs that's a photograph of mao recovered from a naga insurgent uh, after you know you know on his way back from training in nagaland and in 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 china in southern china uh, in the 70s and on the right are the last moments before the artillery duel at nathula in 1967 so some of these photographs actually have have, have never been uh, seen before and some of them of course have been uh, you, you know you know i've been um lucky enough uh, to get these photographs from personal collections from the ministry of defense uh, photo archival galleries and, and and places like that uh, and of course i i mentioned the chapter about sri lanka uh, and about how the indian uh, you, you know india's armed forces met uh, uh, a serious challenge from what was the deadliest uh, guerrilla and terrorist force uh, of the time the ltt uh, and the flag of the ltt uh, conveys uh the flavor of the ltt remember who you are fighting and that was a message that constantly uh, came into the to the indian army and of course uh, uh the kind of fighting capability is demonstrated by this cache of uh, arms that was recovered by the indian army uh, ak47s and, and 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 the best equipment that was there at that particular time and lastly uh i have not shied away from 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 uh, uh offering a political overlay to war and conflict Uh, and i have argue, argued in my book that india's military responses have had have had a lot to do with the assertiveness or the diffidence of its political leadership uh, and here you have prime minister indira gandhi uh, who uh, probably was the chief architect of 1971 and on the right you have uh, uh, the current indian prime minister modi uh, who uh, you, you know uh, uh, under whose government there has been a change in 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 uh, postures of of deterrence uh, that which is still a work in progress but uh, you can see the change in posture of course of deterrence that the indian military is attempting to unfold um, as it uh, moves ahead uh, you know you know as india moves ahead uh, on its path to emerging as a power of consequence in the years ahead so i think uh, with this uh, uh, i've come to the end of my short presentation uh, and now it's over to you taylor for your comments thank you for listening um wonderful so uh it's a real pleasure uh to be here uh this morning with you and this evening uh for those uh, coming in from other parts of the world i'm taylor frable uh from uh MIT and it's a real sheer delight to read this book but i also feel like i'm 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 a student here and not a not a scholar or even a commentator because my background is in china Uh, and not uh, in India, um, and so I just wanted to offer four or five reflections uh, based on the book, um, and hopefully some uh, elements that we can tee up uh, for discussion uh, as well. 
And you know, the first is just to say, right, this is an absolutely terrific book uh, and, and a terrific sequel uh, to Arjun's first book uh, that has been mentioned several times. So I just highly commend it to anyone who wants to learn uh, more, right, about the really quite diverse uh, operational experience of the Indian Army in, in sort of uh, it, it, during its entire history, but especially is what is sort of covered in this book in this period since 1972. Um, I think it's going to become the go-to reference for anyone who uh, wants uh, to learn quickly about these various conflicts. Obviously, it won't, it's not the definitive word, perhaps, on, on any of them uh, from a scholarly perspective, but, but nowhere can you get a better introduction to all of them than you can here. Uh, and especially uh, given uh, the fact that right, it is written uh, by someone uh, who has literally spent their entire career uh, uh, as uh, on active duty as a military officer in Arjun's case in the Air Force. And that, I think, brings a really important and special perspective. And so, I mean, I, I, I teach security studies, I run this security studies program, but I am literally an armchair strategist, right? I have, I have never served, I've never worn a uniform for my country, I've never served in battle. Uh, I try to understand, of course, all of these aspects of international security, but I, I have a different perspective. Um, and so uh, Arjun is a real, I, I was sort of thinking about this during his remarks, but I didn't fully appreciate some of the backstory, but he's a real, a uh, scholar soldier, but or schol scholar air marshal, vice air marshal. I mean, to have someone uh, finish their first book while on active duty uh, is really uh, impressive. Um, and as sort of a side note here for any students in the room, I think if you want to know what it takes, uh, right, to write, to, to become a doctoral student, to write a book, you have a perfect example here of someone who is clearly uh, so driven and seized with the importance of this topic that they were able. Uh, not only to produce excellent books, uh, but also to do so uh, while uh, having uh, sort of uh, other duties as well. And so, um, and, and I also want to comment here just briefly at the beginning on the maps. Um, uh, I'm a huge fan of maps, and I, I agree. Like they, they like if you are writing about conflict in and geog and the geography is somewhat unclear, and you lack a map, and the reader is just going to get lost, right? Because they're not going to know. Um, and they're not going to be able to orient themselves in their mind um, as to what, what they're reading on the page. And so the maps really are a tremendous um, asset um, or component of the book. Uh, and, and I think make all of the chapters uh, much more approachable and, and, and easy to engage because you can start to visualize what's happening here. This is a side note. I, I did read uh, in preparation for today that China chapter is quite closely because it is the the one area where I actually know something relative to all of these others, um, and it's so it's so it's so just just on the map that was you know, created uh, to talk about the Sundarong Chu crisis, right? It's actually very difficult to find a map showing where Wangdong is. That's in English, right? And when I was writing my doctoral dissertation, which included a very you know, couple of pages on this crisis, I wish I had the benefit of reading this history in preparation for that, but alas, I, I wasn't able to, um, you know, the, I, I struggled very hard to just to, to I, mean, I could read accounts of what had happened, especially from the Chinese side, but I couldn't put everything on a map to understand, like, what was the tactical situation on the ground? How did this um, sort, of, uh, sort of get triggered in the first place, right? So in, in that sense, um, it's really, really terrific and eye-opening. Um, so, I just want to encourage everyone uh, who's participating today to go out and read this book. You won't be disappointed. Uh, you'll learn a tremendous amount, uh, as I did, and uh, you'll come away um, with a really terrific perspective of of uh, of an of a, a you know a senior uh, military officer who understands military operations uh, and tactics in ways that uh, most individuals like myself simply uh, you know lack the experience to do. Um, so it's a really special combination of talents. Sort of the historian uh, and, 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 and the officer. A uh, second point I sort of wanted to make was on comparative perspective and here thinking about China uh, and sort of Arjun describes India as a warring democracy um, and, and but, but just the list all right, of sheer engagements uh, is really significant in a, a couple of senses, right? It, India's, um, you know, the Indian Armed Forces right, have per participated in, in, in conventional conflicts. Uh, uh, they, participated in irregular conflicts, peacekeeping operations. 
Uh, moreover, they have uh, uh, sort of engaged in military operations in all sorts of terrain and climates. I mean, the sheer sort of diversity of areas where the Indian Army has been able to operate and to operate effectively is really uh, quite significant. And I think perhaps might set India apart from most other major armed forces in the post sort of World War II period. Um, I mean, there are obviously the US and the Soviet you know, forces in the Cold War had a lot of experience in a sort of a different sense, but this is really kind of homegrown experience. And often you know, times you make comparisons between India and China because they were you know, large developing countries like gained their independence uh, in the 1940s um, and you know, large populations, so on and so forth. But I think it, India's operational experience is already as documented in both books, but most vividly in this one is just much more varied than China's. Um, uh, China obviously fought in some pretty big wars, Korea in particular, but very early in its in, in sort of the life of the People's Republic. It did so with pretty basic um, equipment. I mean, it's still mostly light infantry for most of that conflict. Some air support um, and artillery, of course, uh, and air, air support from India, uh, indigenous artillery, some armor, but not a lot. Um, and and that's that that sort of been uh, you know China's major conflict. The war with India in 1962 was a significant conflict, but operationally uh, not 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 as um, sort of large in scale and scope. Um, and then uh, China's invasion of 1979 was sort of uh, was large in terms of manpower. I mean, hundreds of thousands of uh, Chinese soldiers uh, were involved in that um, a conflict, although it was uh, not a terribly sophisticated ones in terms of. Uh, what the Chinese armed forces were uh, attempting to do. And so one reaction I came away from reading this book, you know, thinking about China was like, wow, India, I mean, I, I obviously had a basic understanding of sort of the diversity of operations that India has been involved in, but it really is much more uh, diverse than China, especially when we include the hybrid uh, conflicts uh, there, and, and, and sort of the situation in Jammu and Kashmir and so forth. Right? These are sort of challenges in some ways China hasn't hasn't faced and that that, that India has. Um, bringing me, uh, I guess, to my to my third point to focus on China a little bit. I mean, both both or all three. Um, I mean, three main areas are covered with respect to China. Uh, the 1967 uh, clashes at Nathula and Chola. Uh, sort of the crisis around Sundarung II in 1986 and 1987, although it has sort of earlier origins, as Arjun um, talks about, and then the chapter on the line of actual control. And these are all, I think, critical and of critical importance because of the way in which uh, sort of the U.S. Sorry, excuse me, um, that the India-China relationship is being transformed uh, in in the past few years, um, uh, and to include Doklam, which is also very well covered uh, in this book. Um, I did have one, I guess, uh, small comment, um, which is to say that in, in my account or in my reading of, of uh, 1986, 1987, I think China, China was you know, probably at most engaging in a very limited probe, right? Because it had seen Guangdong as an area where, where Indian forces had been coming up a, a few years prior on a seasonal basis. And I think uh, from China's standpoint, it was probably in an area they thought uh, was meant to be demilitarized, but then you had this really significant uh, Indian uh, reaction. And on the one hand, I think it clearly, as Arjun notes, right, it did um, uh, you know, rebuild the, you know, perhaps the confidence of Indian forces to operate in these areas, especially given that these were the sites of fighting in 1962. But on the other hand, I was thinking, you know, what, what would the lesson be that we take away from this? And if I was in China, on the one hand, maybe one would be deterred by India, but also one might might view India as overreacting, right, to something that was was itself not necessarily intended to be much more than kind of uh, of a kind of tit for tat uh, sort of uh, an encounter along the LAC versus something uh, that you know ended up having pretty profound consequences and then took time to you know years to unwind, right, really until 1993. And this, of course, then makes me think about today in Galwan, uh, where you know the, it, it's very hard, you know, from from the outside to get uh, uh, sources, um, um, you know, in terms or precise uh, numbers in terms of of the numbers of forces in these different uh, places. But you know, most media reports out of India at least say there's about fifty thousand troops on each side, which which means we're in a similar situation to 1986 and 1987. Um, 
Um, I, I don't want to take the parallel too far because China's probe was op obviously much more significant than 1986, 1987. In that sense, I think the Indian response, uh, which is similar perhaps to the earlier period, is totally warranted. But like, how are we going to unwind this in basically a new environment uh, along the LAC that is documented in the book where it's much easier for both sides than ever, ever before to move forces forward uh, and into closer proximity uh, and uh, with uh, you know, much more effective and uh, longer range equipment. And so I guess this is really a question to you, Arjun, that you can answer now or later, uh, which is sort of where do you see uh, sort of this situation evolving on the China and India border in light of um, sort of what you uh, have, have learned in the book? Um, I, so I think that is really critically important. Um, I guess the last two uh, areas to touch upon, I don't want to really talk for much longer, uh, is we're really just questions I, I am wondering, Arjun, if you can uh, uh, reflect on, uh, uh, perhaps as part of our discussion or, or, or later. Um, but I, I guess the, the first is what, what do you see as kind of uh, the, the main kind of legacies, both, uh, both um, in terms of uh, strengths and challenges for India in terms of this operational experience? I mean, some of the insights about devolving authority, I, th I think, were really interesting. Um, so that would be one question for discussion. A second question is, um, and again, drawing on these legacies, what do you think they mean for the future of, of a modern conflict? Um, and you know, India is in this situation where it is you know, kind of gravitationally pulled by two of its neighbors. Uh, those are ground force intensive um, conflicts, obviously with a big air power a component, um, uh, but but in some ways they are they are less um, potentially less high tech than some other uh, domains. Um, and, but those other domains are the ones in which uh, a lot of other major militaries are investing in quite significantly, to include China, but also others. Uh, and then, of course, you have this inherent tension, perhaps, between those land border conflicts and the gravitational pull they exert versus the growing importance of the maritime domain. And so I would just love to hear your thoughts on, on how you think these legacies have thus prepared uh, India for future modern conflict or as modern conflict as it will be evolving uh, in the future. Um, so just to wrap up, it's a really terrific book. Um, I think one will learn a tremendous amount about uh, not just India's experience, but also just uh, operations and tactics in a variety of really challenging uh, environments and domains. And uh, I hope everyone uh, else uh, enjoys reading it as much as I did. Thanks so much for having me here today. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Taylor. And I think, um, Arjun, I'd love to give you a chance just to respond um, particularly to the questions that uh, Taylor raised um, uh, regarding, uh, I think, the one on the evolution of the uh, Galwan uh, Valley uh, area. Uh, and then also, I think, the very interesting questions he raised about these, um, uh, the legacy questions and also looking uh, towards the future. Uh, I think those are uh, the most salient ones, perhaps, to address. So I'll turn it over to you. Okay. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks, James. And thanks, Taylor, for those very generous uh, comments. Um, and I really hope uh, others to enjoy the book. Now, two questions. Uh, Taylor, what, what do you, how do you see the current crisis unfolding over the next couple of years? Uh, I think uh, one, way, one way is to play safe by saying that one doesn't know. But the other way is to look at look at events from the past and try and paint a mosaic of what's likely to happen. So one is that China is going to keep pushing. And the second is that India is going to keep pushing back. Now, whether that pushing and pushing back is going to flare up into a conflict is again something that I would like to put my finger on and say that the worst case scenario that I, that, that, that I envisage in probably the years ahead is that if there is sage political intervention, then probably one will walk five steps back and go back to a period of no war and no peace and confidence building measures and tranquility along the line of actual control without any, really, without any real resolution of the border problem, which is at the root of the crisis. Do I see the border problem being resolved? I don't think the border problem is going to be resolved in a hurry because I think it demands uh, 
tremendously uh, sage and forward looking statesmanship which in today's world environment is actually very difficult to demonstrate with everybody looking inwards and 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 a lot of uh, nationalism spreading across the world inward looking uh, philosophies so so uh, and when it comes to conflict um, i don't think we will see a flare up of a large extended zone conflict across the line of actual control if anything it could be limited to skirmishes or it could be limited to a high intensity in- engagement over a couple of days that will quickly deescalate because of the potential for escalation does not appeal to both china and to india so so that is that's my uh, broad prognosis of how i see this particular crisis evolving uh, but i think uh, a lot of it will depend on the kind of indian reaction or the kind of indian pushback uh, let me come to the second issue of how you see uh, india's armed forces coping with full spectrum conflict uh, and, 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 you, you know uh, i think even though india is faced with two conventional adversaries on on its western and northern frontiers but uh, i would again be a little skeptical to argue whether the entire length of these frontiers are likely to see conventional conflict i don't think so here again what india's armed forces probably need to prepare for uh, is limited conflict uh, in very terrain high intensity engagements with a certain amount of collusive element in case uh it, it's a china pak uh, you know you know china pakistan collusion on the military front but where the indian military needs to be far better prepared in the years ahead is how it's going to deal with the gray zone how it is going to deal with continued stress along the line of actual control and the line of control what we can you know what the chinese love uh, to call or what even in the united states here a lot of scholars uh, talk about all measures short of war so i think concepts of coercion and deterrence need to be redefined uh, as to how much one can push when to push and when to step back and mind you all this will continue under a nuclear overhang so the chances of nuclear escalation while extremely remote still has to be kept in mind and therefore control of the escalation ladder is going to be very very important and w- and 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 with india attempting to push the escalation ladder in terms of coercion and deterrence that's also going to be something that needs to be followed on uh, for example uh, uri balakot all these instances are 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 cases of india pushing back uh, and attempting to uh, unfold strategies of what i would what i term as proactive deterrence how well proactive deterrence emerges I- I- in the years ahead and how well it leads to conflict mitigation is something uh, we, we, which 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 would be interesting to track as far as how india's armed forces cope with wonderful thank you arjun that's very uh uh interesting response that also incorporated uh a, a kind of an answer to one of the questions that had come in which was addressing the issue of uh uh what what you think in terms of the possibility that things might escalate to nuclear confrontation and things like that and i think you've you've addressed that um i would just like to say a few things uh, quickly before raising a, another question which is to say that um i think uh taylor's praise for the book uh, i would just like to echo a few things and also just comment a little bit on the style um i'm somebody who who doesn't work at all in military history uh and things like that and I was a, a bit intimidated thinking I would have a really that this would be a very difficult read uh, for me to be quite honest and immediately I was drawn into the book I thought the way that you opened it up um with a very clever use of your uh of your experience as a fighter pilot and as an author uh for those of you if I don't give away the entrance of the book or the the book too much but uh to try to draw people into it uh linking together uh your thinking about a fire, fighter pilot taking a first and a second pass uh on a target uh and then uh discussing your your two, these two books uh, together in that 
same sense and thinking of this book as kind of a second pass over the over the field I thought was just a really uh, a beautiful way to to draw the reader in and and I would have to say uh, for a book on military history uh, for all of the detail of operational strategy and all of that I would even venture to say that at times it reads poetically I mean this is uh, I just found it a, a really beautiful read I mean that's uh, not something I was expecting to say about a book of military history so thank you it was just a very uh, uh, a wonderful narrative. Um, and to weave in uh, something else that Taylor brought up here about the diversity of areas, uh, I thought that was, this was exactly something I was going to comment on as well. I mean, the thing that um, really struck me, um, and you brought this up in some of your slides, but uh, we go from the, the chapters that particularly uh, appealed to me uh, were um, six and seven, uh, which were the chapters on the Shaqian Glacier, which I think you said those were some of your uh, kind of favorite parts to write as well. Um, for me, the reason was I used, I, for many years from around 1986 or so, I would spend every summer in Northern Pakistan up in Baltistan. And so I spent a lot of time out in Skardu. And I, I actually, at the time was seeing a lot of the, the troops and military flow through that area. Didn't understand it at all at the time. Uh, and, and now reading your account of it here, I, it brings back all these memories of, of, of that time and seeing uh, what I saw there. And so I felt that those were uh, uh, particularly uh, interesting uh, chapters, uh, but also extremely timely in the sense of what we witnessed last May and June uh, in the Galwan Valley and helping to unpack uh, a lot of that. Um, but then we go from the heights of the glaciers uh, and uh, these in incredibly uh, cold and inhospitable areas. And uh, the other chapter I really appreciated was chapter nine uh, on uh, uh, actually, yeah, on the um, on Sri Lanka and this tale about the ugly submarine uh, story. I mean, that just gripped me of just that uh, narrative. So we go from the heights of the mountains all the way to the undersea uh, uh, in submarines. Um, uh, uh, just to, uh, for those who haven't read the book yet, this is the kind of uh, diversity in addition to covering uh, uh, the roles in, in Korea and in Africa as well. I would just say this kind of geographical diversity there is really uh, intriguing. What really impressed me was as well is that this is a book, uh, as everyone knows, is published in 2021, but you include an afterward um, that's actually dealing with that May-June conflict, which in addition to being uh, a uh, still within when you wrote your first book, still being in the midst of service, writing that book, this had a different challenge as a scholar. I think all of us recognize the difficulties of analysis of things that are happening under our very noses. And so you wrote, you must have been writing that chapter uh, in order to meet the publication deadline uh, as these things were taking place um, and you're assessing them as you went along there. Um, and so I wonder if you could, I would love to hear you just reflect a little bit on what you wrote in that afterward and uh, perhaps a year on now, uh, if you have any other uh, uh, thoughts uh, about that. Um, and just one final uh, comment just to, uh, before turning the mic back to you was that um, you highlighted uh, that two of you, you know, uh, one of your favorite parts of the title was the uh, subtitle about changing contours of modern conflict. What struck me, however, was though that the most recent conflict uh, that we see in the Galwan Valley Indeed, I was expecting to, you know, to learn about all of these uh, kind of new uses of, uh, of science, uh, cyberspace, other forms of military engagement. I thought that was maybe what that was referring to here. Yet that most recent conflict, as far as I understand it and the way you related it, was really the most barbarous in some sense where no modern weapons were used whatsoever. It sounded like it was being fought with sticks and rods. And, and uh, although uh, Taylor mentioned too, this buildup of what something like 50,000 on each each side. It sounded like it was kind of a small group of people just going at it with hand-to-hand -hand combat, and it just seemed out of proportion uh, to these great military powers of India and China, uh, and, and it comes down to kind of a fist fight that's taking place and having these huge implications. So I wonder if, if you might just comment a little bit about that uh, or help me understand that situation uh, as well. So thank you very much. And like I said, it was a really wonderful uh, uh, um, read for even a non-specialist of, 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 of military history. I'll just uh, admit that. So thank you. Thanks, James. And uh, uh, I was, I was in two minds whether to, whether to put my money uh, in the bucket when it comes to writing about Galwan. But then I said, uh, I said, I, you know, 
I wouldn't have forgiven myself if I didn't take that call to at least acquaint readers with what happened, why it could have happened, what could have been responses, what were actual responses according to my assessment. And, uh, and all this uh, taking place under the umbrella of confidentiality, under the um, umbrella of, of complete blanking of, of information available in, in, in what is probably the most hostile battleground uh, uh, you, you, you know, in the world today. So it was, it was a tough call to write about Galvan, but I must say that I was, I was fortunate to be able to speak to several people and make my own analysis. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and that's why if you noticed, I've stopped uh, at the end of August, uh, after the special forces action by the Indian military took over, the, took over some strategic heights, uh, uh, you know, uh, on the North and the South Bank, which I think led to de-escalation. Now, did it lead to disengagement? No, it hasn't led to disengagement, but it certainly has led to de-escalation. And, and, and the, 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 there are two issues that I want to bring, bring to notice. One is the barbaric nature of the clash that took place in Galwan. It, it, uh, it is actually surreal because on the one hand, you have equipment like the Rafale, the S-400, the J-20, uh, you you have uh, you have sophisticated equipment on both sides, and yet there is a perception on both sides that there is a way in which humans can engage and interact on the ground that avoids conflict, and that engagement between the Indian and the Chinese troops has been, uh, you know, you know, has been at times uh, downright uh, comical when it comes to for anybody else. But for commanders and troops on the ground, that has been a way of ensuring escalation does not take place. I mean, you say you have, uh, you know, there is this episode that I've written about, uh, or no, I've, I've not written about it, but uh, when I was interviewing uh, uh, General, uh, you, you know, one of the generals in, uh, who was deployed during the Sundarung Chu, uh, on, the, on the Tibetan, uh, on the Sikkim Plateau, uh, you used to have incidents of the Chinese soldiers kicking stones across by a few feet and the Indian soldiers kicking it back to restore status quo. And then you have over the years pushing and shoving without any troops, flag waving as all means of uh, ensuring that flare ups don't take place. And so I'm sure the Galvan incident also commenced with that intention. But what changed was, uh, I think the the response from the Chinese side. The response from the Chinese side at Galwan was something that the Indian troops had never seen before. Extremely violent, spiked rods, and obviously one thing led to another and it sparked off into what I would call a medieval barb, you know, barbaric engagement. But having said that, subsequently too, the taking over of the heights by special forces was again done in order to avoid escalation. Now, several commentators in India were, were arguing that, look, the only way in which India can push back uh, if it carries out kinetic uh, attacks against selected Chinese positions so that you, you, you send a message that you mean business. However, none of that was tried out till the Indian army built up forces over two months and then carried out these precision operations with special forces that did not lead to an engagement. So, you know, it's a very, uh, you know, even, even being somebody from the Indian military, uh, I have found it hard to understand the dynamics that exist across the line of actual control. And I think it's only uh, the Indian army that is faced with this day in and day out actually understands the dynamics and, and escalation dynamics across the line of actual control. So actually technology, technology may come into play in, in a limited high intensity conflict. Uh, but but uh, you, you know uh, that doesn't fit into the current scheme of things as yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one wonders. I mean, this issue uh, that both of you have raised about uh, this kind of balance between uh, restraint and force is a is a really uh, 
tricky one, it seems to me, in the context of, uh, of what's playing out here, too, because we have rising ethno-nationalism in, in each place. And how uh, is that going to alter uh, this uh, equation? And, and I know a lot of people have been giving thought to this issue in, in terms of who's going to, uh, you know, how far is that going to push uh, versus how much is that also kind of balancing things out in terms of restraint? One, th- one thing I was hoping to ask, uh, Tyler, if he doesn't mind as well, is that, um, you know, for better or worse, uh, Arjun's book is a, an insider's uh, kind of look from the Indian military side of things and a very impressive list of, uh, of um, interviews that you did with uh, figures in the Indian military and all of that. Um, but given the central role of China in the story, um, we all we do have a kind of missing voice in some of that as well. I mean, one can't do it all. And I, I, I was just curious in terms of uh, Tali's perspective on working on China would, uh, you know, what might have uh, 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 been useful in terms of uh, interviewing or representing, say, the Chinese side of this uh, story as well. Or is that even possible? Or is how might it have, uh, you know, sort of nuanced some of the, the story that's told here? Um, I'm not sure if you want to take a stab at that Tyler or not but yeah no I'm happy to um it's a great question because I think there's some interesting uh similarities and differences and so obviously the differences especially for uh, a foreign scholar like myself it'd be very difficult to go interview lots of Chinese officers with combat experience uh but it, it is also probably difficult even for many Chinese scholars who are not in the military to do that right so this is a group that is just very difficult to gain access to um, due to the stovepiped and closed nature of the Chinese system. It's just, if you're not in the military uh, or in a, in a different unit in China, your, your interactions across work units are just very, very uh, siloed and, and, and challenging. The flip side, however, is that um, China does, and Chinese generals have published uh, pretty extensive memoirs and biographies, uh, which don't touch on the the tactical details that Arjun's able to uncover. So like, I don't think I could get a biography right of the commander on the Chinese side in 1986, 1987. But I, I did, you know, I was able to read, you know, at least I think the, the, one of the military region commander's memoirs, uh, which touched upon that incident, right? But he was probably at too high a level. So, uh, so, 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 so you wouldn't be able to get it from someone who was like on the scene. Um, uh, but also because it's sort of a Leninist state, they really do document their history. And so China in 1994 published, you know, the Academy of Military Science in Beijing published a very detailed history of the war with India. That is, I think, more detailed than any history that the Indian military has at least made openly available. Um, and I mean, there's the Henderson Brooks report and sort of I mean, what there was this MOD report from India that came out, but the Chinese one is actually really well, you know, it's from the Chinese perspective. And so you can't read it in isolation. It is not, it is not, you know, the act, you know, I mean, as a historian, you would want to read all of the official accounts and then kind of you know, weigh the evidence and come up with your, your own assessment. But, but because of this sort of tendency of writing things down, with, which, you know, both, both draws on kind of Chinese heritage and from some, some, you know, more recent socialist Leninist kind of tendencies, right? You can actually come across a lot of information. Um, uh, at the same time, it, it would probably be, have less detail on the operations, uh, sort of de- or it would have less information on the details of the operations that Arjun was able to sort of uncover. And of course, uh, he has the ability and, you know, to talk to people and, you know, um, um, and, and, and is in a society where he can then openly publish this information. And so right in China, you know, there may be individuals who are conducting these kinds of interviews, but you can't imagine it would, it would only be published right, with the permission of the Chinese army and thus it would have to be the sanctioned history. Um, um, so, so, so it's not impossible in China to do this, but I don't think you could actually write Arjun's book, right? <laughs> like the Chinese edition, at least in the way that China is kind of uh, set up today. There is a really good book by a scholar, uh, Li Xiaobing, uh, who's a historian uh, that is sort of, I guess would be the combination of Arjun's two volumes, you know, so it's like a history of the PLA since 1949, but it, but it, and it uses lots of these sources. It's a great introduction, but it, but it also is at a very high level. And, and just by nature of those sort of, uh, the sources doesn't have too, as much on operations uh, as Arjun's book has. Thank you very much, uh, Taylor. So um, let's take uh, one of the questions we have from the um, 
from our audience here too, uh, um, Arjun, and this is uh, concerning the um, Operation Checkerboard and Brass Tax operations. And basically the comment or the question was uh, that in 1986, uh, Rajiv Gandhi's government launched these two operations on the China and Indian border and the India-Pakistan borders respectively. And what is the exact rationale behind the linked Indian exercises of checkerboard and brass tax? And why did India launch these two operations when uh, India was seeking to improve its relations with Pakistan and China? And was this the earliest implementation of India's two-line uh, combat plan? And I know you address some of these in your book, so. Uh, you know, when you talk about uh, exercise brass tax and exercise checkerboard, now, uh, uh, readers would do well to, to differentiate between an exercise and an operation. Exercise brass tax was an operation, was an exercise on ground with troops. Exercise checkerboard was an exercise in academies and in think tanks without troops. In, uh, you, you know, in Eastern Army Command at the Army War College. So, so, so the two things were different. Exercise brass stacks uh, was was unrolled by General Sundarji, uh, India's talismanic uh, army chief in the 1980s, uh, who essentially wanted uh, to infuse an element of confidence and maneuver into India's military strategy. And it was primarily a doctrinal shift. It was not any kind of muscle flexing Exercise brass tax was not designed to provoke Pakistan to go to war. It was, pro it was designed to test the Pakistani reaction and the Pakistanis reacted. And like most uh, escalation in the India-Pakistan conundrum in the 80s and the 90s, any minor escalation is grabbed by the West and blown rather out of proportion and indicated as ominous as ominously heading towards war. So exercise brass tax was an assertive move by an aggressive Indian army chief to validate certain concepts that would propel the Indian army particularly, not only the Indian army, but also joint fighting capability uh, somewhere in the direction in which Western armed forces were progressing because General Sundarji had, 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 had done his war college in, uh, uh, in the United States uh, I think he was influenced also to a certain extent by the U.S. Uh, Army's airland uh, battle doctrine. And, and therefore, it was a natural progression towards modernization, both in hardware as well as thinking in the Indian military. Exercise checkerboard was clearly an attempt to signal to the Chinese that we are willing to stand up to you by employing our re-engineered military. And that is why if, uh, you, you know, Taylor will bear with me, that that was the first time that air power, the Indian Air Force was used extensively to build up forces around Sundarong Chu. And in fact, the generals involved with exercise checkerboard, and in fact, uh, uh, the spin-off from exercise checkerboard was actually Operation Falcon. So Operation Falcon was the, uh, was the operation on ground uh, that, that, that saw the massing of forces uh, in, in, in the Tabang region to counter the Chinese, uh, uh, you know, uh, what Taylor mentioned. So, so I don't think they were excessively muscular manifestations of Indian military power. They were merely attempting to propel Indian military power to a new level and modernize both equipment and thinking. Great. Taylor, any comments from you? On, or... No, no, that's fascinating. Um, that's okay. Great. Yeah. great. Wonderful. Um, I wonder, uh, I, I would like, to, um, we don't have, there's no other questions from the audience right now. So I wonder if I wouldn't mind just bringing up a, um, a slightly different topic here that, um, you know, in your uh, comments, Arjun, you mentioned um, that there is a kind of a political overlay. Uh, and, and it's very difficult, obviously, to separate always, I think, military history from political history. And I, um, I just have one kind of a, uh, maybe perhaps a critical question that I would like to, you, you, you mentioned that um, in your opening comments about a sort of openness to, uh, uh, to raising perhaps some difficult questions as well. And, um, and this might be fall into that category there, uh, which is um, particularly about chapters three and four, when you write about uh, Mizoram, Nagaland, and, and particularly Manipur. And um, 
So uh, I, part of me is wondering if by uh, situ- these were chapters, um, I think, which you mentioned also might have gone in the first volume because of the earlier history, uh, but they were included in this one. Um, but I also wonder if one takes a longer historical viewpoint here, um, the sort of uh, description of, of particularly areas like Manipur as um, kind of insurgencies where the uh, Indian military has engaged in the descriptions that you give there. Um, might also be uh, um, viewed from a slightly different perspective of, well, insurgency uh, often uh, entails this um, notion of revolt and things like that. But from a, from a Manipuran uh, perspective, from those from Manipur, these, this was an independent state uh, that had a you know, constitution prior to India that, and some of the engagement from the Indian side in terms of incorporation were really following along uh, what the British uh, had already instituted. And so I just wonder how, if a critic you know, was to you know, sort of raise that kind of question, what uh, type of response might be given. Um, uh, uh, you know, clearly there are some uh, connections you showed the picture of Mao, and I'm sure uh, Taylor has uh, more information on this than myself of kind of uh, collaboration, perhaps, between the Naga, Nagaland particularly. Um, but uh, it is something that was raised, you know, in my mind in terms of thinking about how one, uh, you know, frames a discussion about a, a topic like that, where it might have a, a, a slightly different vantage point if one is looking from a, from a different direction on it. Uh, you know, James, I would... I would first look at all these as fault lines, uh, fault lines in, in, in the growth of Indian democracy. You see, when, when India gained independence from colonial rule in 1947, several Western historians and strategic commentators predicted that India was too disparate, too diverse to last as a nation state. Now, 75 years down the line, uh, I think the very fact that the Indian nation state has has held together as one uh, is, is, is a reflection of a coming together of cultures, regions, languages, and religions uh, to remain a homogeneous unit. Now, obviously, large states such as India will always face problems on its periphery. And particularly when the periphery is, 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 uh, is flanked by hostile adversaries. So it was something, uh, you know, it was a something that uh, uh, successive Indian governments have always been challenged with. Uh, they've always been cognizant of, of, of proxy elements, both in Nagaland, in Manipur, uh, uh, and in all the insurgencies. Uh, and I think if one looks at the track record, the Naga insurgency is probably the longest insurgency in the post-World War II history. The Indian Army entered Nagaland, uh, uh, you know, in order to put down the insurgency in 1955 or 1956. The insurgency is all but over right now, and and we're, and and, and uh, what the uh, uh, what parties are now searching for is for robust reconciliation and governance. And, and, and I think the Northeast uh, has, has seen significant peace over the, last, uh, over the last couple of years. But yes, the Chinese influence was phenomenal in the 1960s and 70s, because if you, if you look at it, that was a time when uh, obviously uh, you would like to create instability uh, along the periphery with a potential adversary. Constantly keep an adversary unsettled. And that was the strategy that was attempted with the Northeast. It didn't pay dividends. And I must say the Chinese were wise enough, reasonably wise enough, uh, you know, to cut their losses uh, uh, in the 1990s and 2000s when the support for that insurgency uh, died down. But there are signs now from several political and social commentators in the region that that, uh, Chinese interference in the Northeast is not over. It's something that India still has to be careful about. And I don't think India's periphery, both in the Northeast and in, in, in Jammu and Kashmir, is, 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 is settled as yet. It, it, it's something which a large state like India has to grapple with. Yeah, good point. I mean, this is, uh, it's an incredibly diverse region, uh, as I don't have to impress upon you, but I mean, with over uh, some 200 uh, or more different ethnic uh, peoples in those regions as well. So it presents a very complicated problem. So um, 
Uh, I th we're getting close to our uh, time here, but uh, Taylor, if you, I don't know if you had any final comments that you would like to interject. Um, um, no, no, I, I think it's, it's been a great discussion. Um, and I guess I look for, I, I don't know, or, like if this was the sequel, like what's the next <laughs> book going to be? That's what I really want to know. <laughs> uh, that's a difficult question, uh, Taylor, because uh, uh, what, what I'd like to do, uh, there are a couple of things that I'd like to do. One is that, uh, uh, that I'd like to compress or condense uh, the big picture in terms of strategic lessons from war and conflict in contemporary India into a, into a slim and a readable, and, you know, you know, and an easily readable volume that even policymakers could just pick up and leaf through. Uh, uh, you know, you know, for value. So it, it, it's something much shorter and much more, much tighter that I'm looking to write. Uh, and I'm also looking at, uh, I'm looking at exploring this very, very nascent area in India of military biographies. Uh, unlike here in the United States or in the United Kingdom, where military biographies uh, are, 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 are uh, several, uh, robust military biographies in India are, are, are very few. So biographies is another thing that I'm looking at, uh, but 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 for now I think uh, I'm just uh, I'm just glad to be uh, back at the NDC and, and and doing a little bit of work that I like doing. Wonderful. Well, for some reason it seems as if I have this intriguing uh, connection uh, to. Uh, even though I work in the area of, of East Asian religions primarily and, and, the, <laughs> and Buddhism, which is uh, primarily, as, as people often describe as a, uh, you know, a, a religion emphasizing peace and all of this, we know that, that uh, in reality, they've also had their issues and particularly in the history of, of Sri Lanka as well. Uh, but pr that's my area. But I keep getting uh, drawn into these in very interesting discussions and, um, with, uh, that are related to uh, military history and also even more than that. That even um, uh, particularly with Air Force and pilots. Um, before I moved to Harvard, I, I taught at the University of Michigan, and one of my colleagues was Donald S. Lopez Jr. Um, his father, Donald S. Lopez, uh, was a decorated ace flying uh, uh, fighter pilot uh, that flew planes uh, in China as part of the Air, Army Air Force's 23rd Fighter Group, which had taken in a lot of those pilots from the Flying Tigers. And these uh, Americans were volunteers flying for the Chinese against the Japanese piloting these Curtis P-40 Warhawks and North American, these P-51 Mustangs and things like that. He later went on, so he became one of the instrumental figures that helped to develop uh, the Smithsonian's uh, National Air and Space Museum and, and passed away in, in 2008. But prior to that, I was uh, brought in uh, when his he wrote a memoir, which you might uh, enjoy taking a look at, called Into the Teeth of the, of the Tiger, which provides a pilot's eye view of this uh, 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 program of working in China and describing his missions there. Um, and the book was then uh, translated into Chinese. So I was a reader uh, to, uh, to assess that book in the translation uh, at the time. So anyway, I seem to have this very uh, intertwined kind of history with uh, fighter pilots and uh, in this kind of history, which is outside of my main area of research, but it's certainly something that I've really enjoyed learning from. And um, and like his book, uh, which is a very reader friendly uh, one from somebody, you know, for uh, somebody, a general reader as well. I just found your book uh, in, incredibly engaging and, and I learned a, a, a tremendous amount from it and thinking about and hearing uh, Taylor's comments too about uh, projecting forward and thinking ahead. These are going to be some of the major issues, I think, of our time as we look uh, Look into the next uh, five, uh, 10 years and, and watching this unfold will be, uh, uh, and I'm certainly in a position now just to better appreciate uh, when I read about these conflicts, uh, what some of the background is and some of that history. So I really uh, would like to thank you for your book and also thank you for joining us uh, today. And thank you to Taylor for uh, your perceptive comments on this and your reflection on, on the book as well. Uh, so thank you both. Um, and uh, wish you well. Uh, and uh, we look forward to the, uh, I don't know if we're going to get a prequel or, a, or something later, but uh, we'll uh, definitely keep an eye out for more of your writing, uh, Arjun. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you, James. Thank you, Taylor. And thank you, Tenzin. Mm -hmm.